Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's NITEC COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, today, we have a wonderful talk where we're going to have speakers from the UK and Germany. We're going to discuss variants of concern. We're going to learn from the experiences in the UK and Germany. Um, before we start, I just want to we'll go over some quick introductions and uh, sort of lay the lay, lay of the land for everyone to understand exactly how the day is going to progress. So uh, just a brief introduction. My name is Dr. Radu Postelniku. I'm a pulmonary and critical care faculty over at Bellevue Hospital and New York University School of Medicine over in New York. Um, and we, you know, we're one of the original members of NITEC. So this is a wonderful discussion that we have set up for everyone to fully understand sort of where we are now with the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm really excited for this. Uh, next slide, please. I'll go over very quick introductions and then we'll have our first speaker, Dr. Jeffrey uh, Barrett from the UK, who is going to be discussing COVID-19 variants of concern from the UK experience. That's going to be followed by Dr. Alexander Gurig, who's going to be talking about uh, the different, what's different in the third wave of the pandem pandemic in Germany. And after that, that's when we're going to have more questions and answers uh, with NITEC. And I'll go over briefly what some of the resources are that we have as well that we can share with everyone. And we'll wrap up the talk uh, within the next one hour. And lastly, um, just a brief introduction to the uh, to NITEC, which is the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. This is uh, it was created in 2015 through emergency supplemental funds that we received from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and specifically from ASPR, which is the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response, and from the CDC as well. It's a collaboration between Emory University, Nebraska Medicine, and uh, New York Health and Hospitals Bellevue Hospital with an overall mission to increase the capability of the US public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. And we've grown significantly over the last several years. And you know, this webinar is one way that we have this outreach as well. In brief, we have four areas for us, uh, as far as our overview, um, four areas of our work. Uh, we can do consultations through on-site assessments and consultations. We have education through in-person and online offerings, such as this right now. Um, we have online resources and virtual assistance at uh, anitech.org. And lastly, we're a large resource, uh, research network with 10 uh, large regional Ebola centers as well, and other special pathogen treatment centers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is Dr. Jeffrey Barrett, who's going to be speaking on the UK experience of the COVID-19 variants of concern. Dr. Barrett is the director of the COVID-19 Genomics Initiative at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. Um, this initiative has sequenced and analyzed more than 275,000 samples for positive tests around the UK in you know, real time in order to help guide the public health and response to local outbreaks. Prior to that, Dr. Uh, Barrett used high throughput genomics to study the genetic basis of human disease in both industry and academia. So without further ado, Dr. Barrett, please take us through your talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Radu. Uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what we've done in terms of sequencing uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, and how um, we're trying to deploy that in actual public health response uh, in the UK. Um, so, to begin with, just to give some definitions of terms, um, so the SARS-CoV-2 virus has a genome, an RNA genome that's about 30,000 bases long, uh, and each circulating lineage accumulates about one new mutation every two weeks. So what I mean by that is, if I get infected and infect someone else and they infect someone else, and you kind of follow that chain, then approximately once every two weeks, that chain will add a new mutation. And that's happening in kind of all the millions of chains around the world. And what that means is that since the pandemic began uh, late 2019, the virus has been accumulating mutations that we can use as a kind of barcode to track it as it moves from place to place and person to person. And I say barcode because in fact, almost all of the mutations the virus accumulates are biologically neutral. They don't change its function in any way. And so mostly they are about epidemiology about using it as a way to track the virus. And in fact, in 2020, I, I would say the only mutation with an unambiguous effect on transmissibility was the so-called spike D614G mutation. It happened pretty early in the pandemic, I think in about uh, February or March, and it quite rapidly spread throughout the entire world. So there's almost no uh, D, which is the Wuhan ancestral position at this base, left anymore. This was, and we'll kind of come on to how this has changed a lot, but there was a slight concern in that, for example, all of the vaccines that are currently in use 
were based on the D at this position. So they, you know, one of the things about making vaccines very rapidly is that they use the reference as it existed in late 2019. Um, it's pretty clear now that this position, although it somehow the biology is not totally understood, confers increased transmissibility, doesn't seem to have any effect on vaccine efficacy. Um, so we work with Public Health England um, to try to classify when sometimes these variants might have biological different properties. The WHO has a has a similar um, scale. The CDC is a similar scale. I know they try to coordinate, but they're not all exactly the same. I'm going to use the terms uh, VUI or VUI, variant under investigation, and uh, variants of concern or VOC, uh, which is the, the the two terms that the Public Health England uses. And the link here, which you can click on when you get the slides, will take you to some detailed information about that. Um, so one of the things PHE does is this risk assessment framework. Again, there are other international versions uh, that are similar. It looks at these different factors. So for example, aspects of uh, transmission between humans and other possible animal reservoirs. This is not usually focused on, but you might remember it feels a bit like another lifetime, but there was a story of the Danish mink variant in 2020. And that's one of the things uh, that was looked at then. Uh, a really key question is, do these variants have any evidence of increased transmissibility between humans? As I'll come on to, this is actually not as easy a question to answer as it might seem when you see the cases growing very fast in a particular location. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cause and effect relationship to a variant. The next one is the um, severity of the infection. Does it cause severe clinical disease, hospitalization, death? I think Alex is going to talk a little bit more about this than I will. Um, is there a difference in the um, how the virus can evade immunity conferred by previous infection? Um, similarly, is there a difference in how the virus can evade immunity conferred by a vaccination? And finally, uh, is there a difference in how the virus responds to existing frontline therapeutics and treatments? And so these are the things which you can look at the kind of details and go from green to red. And essentially, the more categories you have on the right-hand side of this, the more likely, uh, the more confident we are in the evidence that essentially this variant has fundamentally different biological properties and therefore needs to be monitored and perhaps responded to in a different way. W one small comment I'll just make on this is um, one might immediately think that a more severe disease is the most worrying thing, um, but actually a strong transmissibility advantage can actually be much more deadly in terms of total numbers than a, um, a small uh, severity advantage because or increased severity, because you can imagine if you get many, because of the exponential growth of infections, if you get many, many, many in, uh, more infections, even if they're only as deadly or a bit more, that can lead to a much higher total burden of morbidity and mortality than a not transmissible, but marginally more severe variant. Finally, the question for most high income countries right now is really this vaccine one, all the other things kind of take a back seat. If the vaccines work against the variants, then the exit plan that's currently in progress in the US, the UK, and other high-income countries uh, is not going to be very derailed. Um, to tell you a little bit about the effort uh, that I'm involved in in the UK, my institution, the Sanger Institute, which is basically a big genome sequencing factory, we were the UK's contributor to the Human Genome Project and have done various genome projects in the uh, subsequent 25 years is part of a bigger network called uh, the Coronavirus Genomics Consortium UK, formed early in the pandemic. It really leveraged a lot of existing expertise and infrastructure in the UK to bring together people uh, working in genomics, virology, bioinformatics, public health, to say, how can we use genome sequencing to contribute to the UK's pandemic response? That um, whole initiative has sequenced 450,000 uh, genomes of SARS-CoV-2 from infected patients in the UK, as Radu mentioned, uh, almost 300,000 of them, so a substantial majority, have been done at the Sanger Institute, where we've set up a very high throughput facility. And that facility is really built as a close collaboration with a network of so-called lighthouse labs, which do um, most of the community PCR testing in the UK. So there was some criticism early on about centralizing this. It does have some potential drawbacks, but actually I think has a lot of advantages for this kind of thing because um, of the vast majority of tests from you know, parking lot test centers or home test kits go to like five or six big PCR facilities. And that means we can have sort of vans every day driving the waste material from those tests to our facility to put them on the sequencers and try to get the turnaround time as rapid as possible. And in fact, right now, 
the Sanger swab in the nose to action turnaround time is uh, about a week, which is pretty fast, um, given all the logistical um, laboratory and bioinformatics steps that have to happen in there. It was much longer early in the pandemic, three weeks in sort of early 2020. We got it down to about two weeks in late 2020, and we've really focused on this turnaround time in 2021. Um, to give you some sense of it, these bands unload into these giant uh, sort of back of a tractor trailer size freezers where these green bins are filled with 96 well plates that come straight off the PCR testing line. We refurbed two of the laboratories at the Sanger Institute, stood all of this up during the pandemic, which of course had its own challenges, have a combined robotic and manual facility to essentially process and pick these thousands of samples. We can now do something like 20,000 a week if we uh, at full capacity, we don't actually need that, thankfully, at the moment, because the, the epidemic has reached a relatively calm point in the UK since about um, uh, late March-ish, so as the, after the um, serious lockdown that was in the UK in the beginning of 2021. Um, what can we do with this? Well, there's a lot of use cases for genomics. Some are about targeted investigations, for example, into an outbreak in a prison or a nursing home or something like that. What we set up to do with this huge high throughput system, so those tests I told you about, they're not targeted at all. Uh, they are almost all uh, what we call surveillance, which is basically a as close as we can get to a completely random sample of positive tests around the country, day by day, week by week, place by place. And we initially were using this to try to, when, when the epidemic was relatively calm last summer, contribute to, for example, detecting super spreader events because this virus has a very over-dispersed transmission pattern. And so uh, large super spreader events can be a big contributor to spread. That's obviously less relevant when you're in a situation with tons of cases every day. What actually happened was uh, we noticed, uh, COG UK partners in Public Health England, um, a, a rapid growth in cases in the Southeast of England in late November. And this was worrying because in November, the UK had gone into a, a kind of light lockdown. So schools were open. There was a little bit of people going to work and some mixing allowed. Um, but basically everywhere in the country, cases were coming down uh, except in the Southeast. And uh, this raised a lot of concern. There were you know, questions in one of the news pieces. One of my colleagues was famously quoted as saying, it can't be that everyone in Kent is at an illegal rave. Um, and what happened was, we noticed at the same time that there was a specific variant of the virus, one of these barcodes I alluded to, that was rapidly increasing in frequency just in the Southeast and in East London. And it'd be difficult to separate the causal biology, i.e. the vi vi virus has mutated in a way to make it spread more fast, uh, more quickly, from uh, the lineage essentially getting lucky. So if basically some breakdown of social distancing or some other factor leads to a spike of cases that whatever happens to be around at that moment can increase in frequency by chance. And so what we needed to do was develop, and we did this as well as other teams in other academic labs, like Imperial College London, for instance, statistical models that looked sort of place by place across England. And because we were sequencing so much, we could just see it as it, as it arrived in every kind of county and region and how quickly it just took over. Um, if I just show you some of the data, here's, this is without any genomes, just the case numbers um, at the end of November, sort of green and blue are relatively calm and the purple bruise is the high rate of cases I told you about in the Southeast. Um, what we did was build this model I alluded to. And so here are three places in uh, England. So Swale is down there in the Southeast where B117 was first seen. Stevenage is a bit further up, uh, close to Cambridge, sort of a bit north of London. And Staffordshire Moorlands is up in the uh, Lake District in the north of England. What you can see in each of these graphs is this is time moving across the x-axis. And uh, blue is kind of various other lineages of the virus that had been circulating since early 2020. Red is actually um, a lineage called B1177, so confusingly similar code name. And you can see it was going up. This red one was increasing over time in the fall, and it actually had arrived with summer holiday makers from Europe. Uh, it originated in Spain and spread to quite a few other places. But green is B117. And what you can see is just the, the proportion of B117 just grows very quickly, no matter when it starts. So it started in late September, early October in the Southeast. And by the time we were looking in late November, it had actually almost completely taken over. 
You go a little bit further away, it was just getting started. But as soon as you play the, the clock forward, it grows again to 100%. And again, same story here, it not even really been seeded by late November this far north in England, but it did grow very, very quickly once it did. Um, you can then further build a model on top of this. So here we can say, okay, this variant is more transmissible. It arrives in places uh, and then grows faster than other lineages. You can use that to estimate the famous R number, uh, so the, the average reproduction number of the virus in a lineage specific way. So you can compare B117, the so-called UK variant to everything else. And um, it, on these plots, basically, if R is greater than one, it's pink, and if R is less than one, it's blue. And that's obviously the, the kind of key balance point because greater than one means the epidemic is exponentially growing, less than one means it's shrinking. And what you can see is that in late lockdown, this was the fundamental problem. The lockdown was basically working in all over England, blue, other lineages were shrinking. Everywhere that B117 had made it, even at low levels, was still growing during this period. So it was really planting the seeds everywhere. And the disaster struck when the country opened up more or less completely in December. And you can see that there's going to be a problem anyway, which I think was predictable that, you know, shoppers were buying gifts before Christmas, etc. And so all lineages started growing slowly again, but maybe it would have been in control. But B117 just was growing extremely fast. Um, so it had an effective R of uh, probably above two during December. So it just absolutely hit an exponential uh, growth phase. And it led to an extremely bad wave in the UK starting in late December and really running through January and February before lockdown brought it under control. And the good news for the UK, but also for the world, is that a very tight lockdown is sufficient to bring the R number of B117 below one. So you can see by late January, when we had been in lockdown in a very almost like spring last year kind of lockdown, other lineages were just being driven to extinction. This sort of dark blue means everything else was just really being squashed. And luckily, everything is basically wider blue for even B117. So if you kind of look at the trajectory over time, you just see all the other uh, variants of the virus going away and B117 slowly, slowly, slowly tailing down, even to today where it's basically all that's left. Uh, up until a few weeks ago, it was like 99% of every new infection in, in the UK was B117. But luckily the numbers after the lockdown and now increasingly with the lifting being uh, covered by vac vaccination in the UK, don't seem to be going back up again. We actually see this pattern. We kind of, the UK, because it sequences so much, um, had a great early warning system. Sadly, it wasn't really fast enough as I just described to prevent a bad wave. We kind of hoped it would be internationally. Some countries did respond. Unfortunately, a lot of countries I think you know, had a wait and see approach where they said, well, maybe this UK variant will arrive or not. But, you know, as we know, once an exponentially growing virus is in a community, it is too late really to stop it. So if you look around, certainly around Europe, basically B117 is everywhere. In the US, you know, as has been focused on, it's now the most common variant of the virus. Just picking a few pieces of data from the very nice outbreak.info website, which gathers global uh, genome sequencing. This is Michigan in the US. So here down here is the sort of epi curve of Michigan. So they got a bad wave in uh, late last year. Some restrictions brought it down again. Michigan was actually unlike most places in the US and had another uh, third wave that was pretty bad. And this top panel, you can see the blue line is the proportion of B117. And it's just absolutely shooting up from basically zero to well over 80% now. Um, if you look in, for example, California, you see a, a somewhat similar picture. On this one, I've actually also included, those of you who follow this kind of thing, the blue and green lines are the so-called California variant, which grabbed the headlines uh, early this year. I suspect the California variant from all the data that's come out since then to have uh, a growth advantage compared to the variants that were circulating in 2020 and certainly the Wuhan reference in 2019. But what you can see is that when California introduced uh, restrictions, it brought both of these variants and increasingly vaccinations under control, and they've been kind of going down to extinction. But again, B117 is uh, proportionally growing and growing. So it seems to clearly have a growth advantage in this circumstance. Worth remembering that th this is, again, the total number of cases. So down here, there aren't very many cases in California. It's in a very good position. So this is just a proportional increase, not an absolute numbers increase. Uh, okay. 
So that's some sense of transmission, and you can get a sense of why transmission becomes such a critical component in evaluating the change of uh, new variants. If you look at the clinical picture, again, I think Alex will comment a bit on this in the German experience, but there have been a whole bunch of studies now of B117. They seem to have a pretty consistent estimate of about one and a half fold um, increased risk of death given infection. Here's a link to one paper. There's a number that have come out. Those, those estimates do vary quite a lot. They're consistently bigger than one. There's a kind of interesting inconsistency that some hospital-focused studies don't find, given that you're in a hospital, an increased risk of death, whereas the community studies just find an overall increased risk of death. How do you marry that up? I think there's a few possibilities. It might change the, the distribution of severity in the community, it might be that the hospitals that do these kinds of careful academic studies are really excellent teaching hospitals. And so their outcomes are a bit better than say the average of all hospitals in the world. Um, not sure, but at the end of the day, actually the, the biggest problem with B117 is just it has caused so many infections. Um, and regardless of variant, you get that many infections, you get bad outcomes. Of course, the question on everybody's mind is, will vaccines work? Um, and the short answer for B117 is almost certainly yes. There's three kinds of data. In vitro neutralization experiments, you take either live virus or pseudovirus with a mutation profile that looks like B117, and you take sera from vaccinated individuals and say, how well do they neutralize this virus? And for B117, there are two links there to the Moderna and Pfizer. Um, it looks very good. There's also some trial data from the UK, which looks pretty good. That's the AstraZeneca vaccine. And finally, there's real world data, uh, which the most promising and, and sort of substantial amount comes from Israel, where they've obviously done an amazing job of vaccinating very rapidly, mostly with Pfizer. If you look at their outbreak, when the vaccination campaign started at the beginning of this year, they were being hit badly by B117. And the fact that now they have basically zero onward transmission suggests that in the real world, the Pfizer vaccine is extremely effective at preventing B117 infection. The last thing I'm going to mention is other variants. Um, in the UK, B117 isn't really a, a variant anymore. It's just what we have. And that pattern is happening place by place around the world. I mean, one thing I would say is any place which is lucky enough not to have B117, like Australia maybe, should absolutely try not to let it spread because the increase in transmissibility just means if you get a bad outbreak, it is very hard to completely stamp it down unless you have vaccinated your population. But we have also seen other, other variants that have different um, biological properties. So um, there is B1351, first seen in South Africa, P1 first seen in Manaus, the capital of the Amazonas state in Brazil. Both of these were observed late last year, around the same time as B117. Both have, as I'll come on to in a minute, uh, several worrying mutations, um, including one E484K, which is by far the one that has the biggest bolus of evidence that it might at least partially reduce neutralization by vaccination. I alluded to B1427 and 429 first seen in California, which seem to be sort of fizzling out now. We That might be a little bit too early to say that. And then the last two, which have really been in the news recently, is B1617. And this is actually is the so-called India variant. There's actually two, arguably three, or possibly more variants of this, which have different mutational profiles and possibly different, um, uh, different biological properties. It's very hard to understand what's happening with these because the situation in India is so tragic but it's a combination of, I think it's it's not a good idea to jump to the conclusion that a variant is causing the situation. It's clearly a combination of what the virus is doing and what people are doing. And we just know that if you have, you know, insufficient restrictions, then you can get very badly exponentially growing outbreaks. Of course, the public health infrastructure in India has better things to do than genome sequencing at the moment. So the picture is not that clear. We have a lot of travel links between India and the UK. It's been restricted more recently, but because we sequence so much, we've actually seen, the UK has seen the most genomes of this variant published, at least in the world. And B1617.2, we had a very strong importation. There's some evidence it's begun to transmit in the community. Public Health England is working hard to try to tamp that down. 
Um, and so it's something we're watching very carefully right now. I don't think we have any strong evidence one way or the other about differences in vaccine efficacy, for instance. One thing which the UK has deployed, which I'm not sure if the US has used, is so-called surge testing, which is when we do see these variants of concern, they will send out mobile testing units and basically invite anybody asymptomatically to just get a test to try to find any networks of transmission of these variants of concern, especially those which could possibly have vaccine escape properties, since obviously that would be the biggest risk to the exit strategy of population vaccination. To give you some sense of the, the numbers on this, this is the proportion of our surveillance, so trying to exclude recent travelers sequences in the UK over time. And you can see there's a bunch of these ones, B1351, I mentioned P1, those are from South Africa and Brazil, respectively. B1525 has got a bit of news. They're bouncing around at much less than half a percent. Um, so watch carefully. They do seem to be ticking up as the UK has loosened its, um, its lockdown restrictions. The thing which everybody is looking at again is this B1617 coming out of India, lots of transmission. We don't yet know whether this is, you could you know, kind of wet your pants when you see this graph, um, but the trouble is there is such a large amount of imports and then kind of household contacts and immediate spread. And since otherwise the, the epidemic is quiet in the UK, it's a bit hard to know how much of a problem this is likely to be. And my last slide is just, uh, I won't try to go through this in detail, this is a really nice visualization from the outbreak.info website I mentioned before, which has the kind of variants of concern with all the different mutations that they share or don't. Um, this E484K is one I mentioned that the immunologists watch very carefully. Uh, there's this N501Y, which is clearly involved in the transmission advantage, though it doesn't fully explain it for B117. And there's some various others that we're trying to learn about. And the, the virus is clearly finding convergent evolution in 2021, where the same mutations and indeed sometimes the same combinations of mutations are arising probably because there's a ton of infections around the world. More infections means more opportunities for more mutations. Selective pressure on either transmission or immune escape just brings some of those to the forefront. And, and that's really going to be the game, I think, for the next year at least, to just watching this to see are any of them going to pose a massive challenge to vaccination. So far, nothing that is terrifying, but we have to kind of watch and see. So thanks very much. Uh, I will hand over now to Alex. Uh, for the next section and look forward to the discussion at the end. All right, thank you for that wonderful uh, talk so much, Dr. Barrett. So I, let's briefly, actually, if we can go back one slide, uh, Alex, I'm just gonna make a quick introduction. So Dr. Alexander Urig is our, gonna be our wonderful next speaker. He is the medical director of both the medical intensive care unit of the Department of Infectious Disease, Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the intensive care services of the Berlin Biocontainment Unit of the Charité University Medical Center in Berlin. Uh, he's also serving as an expert panel of intensive care and ID specialists to the Robert Koch Institute, which is the German version of the CDC, and is an organizer of Save Berlin, a, a multi-level network of 16 ICUs that coordinates ICU beds for COVID-19 patients in Berlin. His uh, ICU was one of the first ICUs of the Charité University Medical Center Berlin to treat COVID-19 patients and is one of three ICUs that form the ARDS ECMO Center for the federal state of Berlin. And he is also one of the investigators of the PA COVID-19 register and central phenotyping platform at the Charité that aims for fast and comprehensive clinical and molecular characterization of COVID-19 patients. So without further ado, Dr. Alexander Orig, please take us through your talk. Thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon from Berlin, Germany. Um, again, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks for your kind introduction, Radu. Um, let me start with my presentation, COVID-19 variants of concern what is different uh, in the third wave of the pandemic in Germany? Um, what you can see on my first slide is an overlay of the real-time data of COVID-19 ICU patients here shown in green uh, on projections of future ICU occupancy in relation to uh, different incidence rates and consecutive reversal of openings and stricter lockdown measures. Uh, the green curve um, of the real-time data basically seems to follow right now the modeling for the more rigorous lockdown measures after reaching an incidence rate of 150, uh, shown in blue here. Um, the fact that the real-time data curve slipped somewhat below the projected curve 
most likely is the effect of people voluntarily staying at home during Easter vacation in Germany. So people seem to have been smarter than the federal and state administrations at that time, going into a voluntary lockdown and reducing social contacts. Um, what we do in Berlin is that we take all the PCRs that are positive for sars coronavirus 2 and do additional PCRs checking for the mutation N501Y and the deletion 6970. And this is specific. Um, this is a specific combination of mutation and deletion, which correlates well with uh, sequencing data for the variant of concern B117, the so-called UK variant. But it's much faster than sequencing. Um, PCR is positive for the mutation N501Y, but missing the deletion 6970 could be either the variant of concern from South Africa or uh, the P1 from Brazil. And you would have to wait for the sequencing results to clear that up. Um, what you can see here is that with the beginning of 2021, B117 is more and more displacing the wild type virus, while the South African and the Brazilian variants are rarely to be found in Germany. Uh, while this chart shows you the Berlin data, the situation in Germany is actually the same as shown here. So what's different now in the third wave compared to the second wave in Germany? While between the first wave and the second wave, we saw a two month period of low ICU occupancy coming from a maximum of 2,900 ICU patients on like April 20th, uh, down to around 230 ICU patients in July and August. We didn't have that breather between the second and the third wave when we came from a maximum of 5,700 ICU patients in the beginning of January, um, down to around 2,700 patients occupying ICU beds when the third wave started to hit, reaching a maximum of 5,100 ICU patients so far. In the end, this meant there still were patients in the ICUs from the second wave that were competing now for the, uh, the ICU capacity with the new patients from the third wave. ICU patients in Berlin uh, seem to be 10 years younger in the third wave, having a mean age of 55 years compared to 66 years, what we were seeing during the second wave. This might be uh, the effect of Germany's vaccination strategy, having completely vaccinated nearly all people over 80 years and most people over 70 years having at least their first shot. In the first two waves, we had general wards full of COVID-19 patients, but in the third wave, we admitted only few patients to general wards compared to a high admittance rate in the ICUs. During the first two waves, most patients typically were admitted to the ICU from the wards. Now we have patients with a history of symptomatic COVID-19 that stay at home for about a week then call an ambulance, and when they reach the hospital, they often have to be intubated uh, in the emergency department. So finally, it feels like more and more younger patients are reaching the ICUs, who then seem to show a rapid progression to ARDS, and thus put a relevant strain on ECMO capacities in Germany. As you can here see, um, the blue line shows you the number of COVID-19 patients on ECMO uh, compared to the total number of patients on ECMO and uh, to the total ECMO capacity in Germany, which is uh, much higher in the third wave compared to the second wave. This slide again gives you an overview over selected characteristics of the different variants of interest and variants of concern.
following the CDC definitions. Uh, in relation to their spike protein mutations here in bold letters, um, that seem to be associated with the so-called immune escape phenomenon. And here is the uh, already mentioned new B1617 a variant, uh, something like a variant under investigation in, in Europe um, already. The CDC declared it now a, a variant of interest, uh, which has two spike protein substitutions, the known L452R uh, and this E484Q. Um, but right now we don't know the actual relevance of the mutation E484Q uh, in comparison to the known mutation E484K, meaning we don't know for sure if it's really a double immune escape showing kind of a synergistic uh, effect. And this slide shows you where exactly um, those immune escape mutations are located within the receptor binding domain of the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein. And uh, this shows you the genome organization uh, for the spike protein, um, including some of the mutations um, within the region that codes for the receptor binding domain that are associated with uh, the immune escape phenomenon. Again, the relevance of uh, this E484Q mutation of the variant from India right now is unclear concerning this possible double immune escape. So from Germany's point of view, the world of SARS coronavirus 2 variants is divided in two. First, the so-called fitness variant with higher transmissibility, no immune escape, uh, which is right now the new wild type virus in Germany. And uh, second, the immune escape variants with possibly reduced neutralization by monoclonal antibodies, convalescent sera, and post-vaccination -vac sera. But right now, the clinical relevance of this immune escape phenomenon is unclear because we rarely see patients with those variants of concern. So quite a few open questions remain. Is B117, the UK variant, not only more transmissible, but more virulent, since we see much younger patients um, in higher numbers on our, our ICUs? Is there a correlation between uh, a rapid progression to acute respiratory failure um, with uh, um, biomarker levels in third wave patients? Why do we see more viral RNA in B117 compared to the wild type virus? And is this really pointing to a higher replication rate? And what is the actual relevance of immune escape? Um, concerning the first question, um, the higher transmissibility of B117 is turning out more infections in the third wave not necessarily more hospitalizations. But due to the fact that most older people have protection after being vaccinated, we are seeing more younger patients compared to the first two waves. Those younger patients might be fit enough to stay at home longer with uh, symptomatic COVID-19, reducing the number of hospitalizations. But in the end, the proportion of people in need of intensive care treatment might be the same compared to the first two waves, meaning the absolute number of ICU admissions um, just being higher because of the higher absolute number of infections within the population due to the higher transmissibility of B117. Concerning the biomarker question, which could give us a hint um, with relation to the virulence of B117, Right now, we are looking into this um, in our PA COVID registry and um, biobank, but we don't have conclusive results yet. Um, concerning higher levels of viral RNA and B117, 
we cannot be sure right now that the higher affinity of the mutated virus to the ACE2 receptor equals a higher number of infected cells that in turn would mean more replication and more viral RNA to be found. Um, concerning the relevance of the immune escape phenomenon, uh, this preprint uh, by Alison Tark and co-workers shows that uh, T cell reactivity of convalescent and vaccinated individuals is not affected by re-exposition to variants of concern compared to wild type virus. But we don't know if this T cell based immunity is guaranteeing a mild cause of disease in case convalescent or vaccinated individuals get infected by a variant of concern and show a reduced antibody reaction. So this brings me to the end of my presentation and I'm open to questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Oerig. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. Bar Dr. Barrett, if you don't mind, just coming on the screen as well. Um, so a wonderful talk from both of you. And I think it opens up, you know, it really shed a lot of light on us understanding these variants and the application of these variants as well, what we're seeing in the UK, what we're seeing in Germany, and really what we're seeing across the world, right? It's something that is not a local phenomena. What's happening in another part of the world is gonna have significant implications on what's gonna happen locally for us, whatever country we may be in. And I think, you know, this is truly, it's a unique time that we live in. You know, if we go back to 1917, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have access to all this information that we have now. And for us now to be able to rapidly sequence something, have a little bit of understanding, but also realize what we really don't understand Right? I think that's the most important thing is that we have this information, but what exactly are we making with this? And I think, you know, if anything, it's opening up more questions for everyone. We see all these variants that we never really studied with coronaviruses in the past, or even with, you know, with influenza, we know that there's different variations every year of the different strains as well. But now for us to have this information and everyone in the world is really trying to tune in and trying to learn more. So it's not just the scientific community, it's really the world community. So that being said, what do we see, you know, where do we see ourselves, not this year, but let's say three years from now, five years from now, or where do you guys individually, and I'll ask Dr. Oregon, Dr. Barrett specifically, where do you see Germany and the UK and maybe the world, where are we going to be three years, five years from now, 10 years from now with this, with uh, coronavirus, with SARS-CoV-2 or uh, with us understanding the disease as well? Yeah, concerning Germany, I think um, sars um, coronavirus 2 won't be dead in 10 years. So we will see it um, on a continuous basis, mostly in form of small clusters in like immunocompromised patients, um, but not as uh, a pandemic form when it uh, will be um, a fact that most of the population will be vaccinated and will reach some kind of immunity. But um, I think um, we won't see a world without SARS coronavirus too. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, I think we're, we're at a moment that's very finely balanced for countries like the the UK, Germany, and the US about if we're lucky and none of these, you know, I, I totally like your characterization of B117 being a fitness variant and these other ones being potential immune escape variants. If none of those are really problematic, and by that I mean they probably have a non-zero reduction on vaccine efficacy, but if it's small, then, you know, I think in a year we will be in a situation where there'll be very low levels in these countries. Everyone will be vaccinated. We might have to do an annual booster. I don't think we really have any clue on that, but that's at the end of the day, not a very big deal, but we won't be past it globally. I mean, I think we, you know, India is such a clear reminder that in some countries it feels like this is almost over and that is not true globally. And that means it's not true for any of us because, you know, India has recorded like 10 million cases in the last month and a half or something. That's probably a vast underestimate. That means there are lots of mutations and variants we haven't seen. Hopefully none of them are going to be very concerning, but it just means there is this source of risk for the whole world. And so figuring out how to, as quickly as we can as a planet, get vaccine distribution to be as equitable as possible is just, you know, it's, it's obviously the humanitarian good thing to do, but for anyone's self-interest, it's the right thing to do. So it's just 
such a clear mission for us, I think. And then if you look forward, I mean, my hope is that in 10 years, the world will be in that kind of situation. There will be pockets and it will be, but it is not going to be on the news. I'm, I'm thankfully no longer going to be called by the radio stations to talk about variants of coronavirus. Uh, it will fade into obscurity, um, I think, in that time frame. And then I think the question becomes, I have no good answer to this, but how do you take some of the awareness globally and use it to motivate better preparedness for the future? You know, I don't think it's going to be another hundred years before something like this could happen. And so we need to figure out, is there a way to not fall into complacency after this does get better? I think that's very excellently put that, that this is a, a long game. This is not a short game and this is a world game yeah. and that we're all have something at stake here. You know, there's a few questions coming through and that have been asked before the seminar uh, as well about vaccinations. And I think, you know, that's something that's difficult for us to fully answer yet, but I'd like to just ask your opinions of where we are right now. The, some of the questions that are coming up is where do we see vaccination? Is this going to be a yearly thing? Is this gonna be something, do we think that the vaccines will have longer effects and we don't have to do it yearly? I mean, I'll, I'll ask, let you answer as each individually, but I think, you know, it, I think the overall answer is gonna be that we don't fully know yet, but I, maybe you have some more information that you can share with us as well from your points of view. Yeah, excellent question, hard to answer. Um, I guess that we see uh, the need to, um, yeah, to uh, have new vaccines within the next uh, 12 to 24 months, I guess. Um, this might be, um, in fact, um, because of uh, openings in, in those countries that have a, a functioning a vaccination program and uh, might be um, a um, fact due to travel from countries like India, which are um, like a pressure cooker for mutations. So what we don't know is what um, the next mutation uh, might offer for those countries that, that have uh, vaccinated their population. So, um, but as, as Jeff told us, it's actually not that hard to, to, um, to change those vaccines uh, for the new variants of, of the future. Yeah, I think that's that last point is, is one I was going to say that it's really a, an amazing time to be alive that these vaccines, various technologies, but especially I think the mRNA technologies yeah. were just ready at the right time and that they're so easily adjustable. You know, I mean, they're already, I'm sure, both Pfizer and Moderna maybe others are already making B1351 variant boosters. Whether, whether they get deployed globally, I don't think we know yet, but I'm sure that they're already making them. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, this is, I'm stepping a bit outside. I, I'm not a virologist by training, so forgive me if I say something wrong. But, you know, when I actually look at how the flu vaccine update process is done, it looks almost kind of stone age by comparison. You know, we've sequenced a million and a half versions of this virus uh, globally and have this exquisite understanding of how individual amino acid substitutions are changing. And, you know, the, the, the flu, I, I'm being a bit jocular, but the, you know, the flu process is kind of doesn't leverage the technology on that scale in any kind of way. And maybe it's a possibility for the future, you know, that flu vaccines have been stuck at whatever they are, 50% efficacy or something, but maybe that can fundamentally change. I mean, that would be a big positive thing that could come out of this pandemic. Well, I think it's interesting what you speak to the flu because we're gonna we the flu essentially for the last year was non-existent throughout the world. Yeah. It's never really happened. But as we're seeing, as you know, we're seeing in our ICUs now, the amount of patients who don't have COVID is now gone down. But we have patients with regular diseases that they've had before. The ICUs are still at capacity, especially in New York. And come next flu season, flu is going to be back there. And the question of the vaccinations for flu is such different because. It is, it's archaic in the way we do it, but also influenza is a vastly different virus than a coronavirus. In a way, we're very lucky that this is a coronavirus outbreak yeah. or pandemic and not due to something like an influenza uh, virus where you'd have rapid mutations all the time. And I think that, you know, that speaks to fortune how we are, but also the technology that we have that we can address that. With the flu, it changes from season to season so wildly that you know, putting technology out there and vaccination strategies out there that will cover it is, is a little bit different because of the mutations that happen so frequently. Um, but speaking to that though, now that we're talking about, let's say the next 
fall winter where we're expecting, especially in the Northern hemisphere that, you know, we're, we still have a little bit of hopefully quiet time in the summer that our Southern hemisphere colleagues, unfortunately are now uptrending, but where do we see ourselves with using such technologies, this rapid sequencing as we see in the UK. And I think the UK is sort of the envy of the world in that you're able to so quickly identify mutations. Is there a possibility to combine that with vaccine strategy to find pockets or even with local strategy, you know, in, uh, enacting lockdowns in those, those areas very, very quickly where we see a rapid uptick. Is that where you envision the UK and maybe hopefully once the rest of the world is, has better uh, up-to-date speed on uh, sequencing as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that's our hope. And like I said, we, you know, we kind of thought we might be able to use this in like September last year when we had a pretty quiet summer and to detect super spreader events and respond more quickly. It, you know, at that, there were two problems. One was at that time, we just weren't fast enough. We still had like a two week lag and that isn't really good enough for public health response. We're now, like I said, about a week, we're getting lower. I think that gets into the, it is, there, there is realistic value. I mean, um, as Alex said, you can, you can also do things like PCR, specific PCR genotyping, if you know what you're looking for, and that can be even faster, of course, because you can use exactly the same technology, basically. Um, but I think we would like to move back into that mode, hopefully, as things get calm in the UK with full vaccination with the summer coming. And you can see things quite differently, I think, when you have now. It's actually, we're sequencing more than half of all new cases now. And the public health authorities have kind of adopted to a world where they just expect to have the genome of every infection, which is a different world than, you know, they've ever lived in before. And that means you can do things like immediately see, is this cluster an epidemiologically linked, genomically linked cl cluster or not? Do we have multiple things happening kind of cryptically in the community? And I think those can be very valuable. Um, one perhaps slightly science fiction, but I think hopeful thing is the amount of detail in which we've studied this particular coronavirus genomically is so deep that I think there's a possibility to learn some lessons generally about this family of viruses and to imagine producing, you know, maybe not pan, but at least multiple coronavirus vaccines that could be effective against components of the proteome that seem to be essential or that we can understand which sort of combinations are sort of can't be mutated away. Um, and that, you know, maybe in a 10 year or 20 year time frame, we'll be in a world where actually we can have things that you don't need to rapidly develop the vaccine from scratch with, with a newly observed virus. I think that's very well put as well. Um, Dr. Ulrich, I don't mean to interrupt you because I think you're answering a question I was just about to ask you as well, which I think will be a, a great question to ask for everyone as well in that we're talking about this, uh, the morbidity and mortality with this, with this virus that we see. Now, where do you see ourselves with patients getting vaccinated and then where do you see the morbidity and mortality potentially coming for those types of patients if they have a vaccine and then they get you know, possible exposure as well to SARS-CoV-2 or a different variant as well? Do we even have any information about that yet or do we have any anticipation of that? Mm. My anticipation would be that uh, those breakthrough infections aren't as severe as, uh, as the natural infection. Um, we actually had some cases um, at the Charité University Medical Center, even within um, our staff. And um, those people usually had uh, a mild fever for about three days and uh, then everything went well. So we didn't see um, at all any severe cases of uh, um, re-COVID-19 after vaccination or even after um, natural infection. Um, yeah, yeah I, I haven't seen data post-vaccination, but the one piece of data I've seen which completely agrees with that is reinfections in a certain survey in the UK and they are systematically lower viral load the second time and less likely to be symptomatic. So I think that's a hopeful data point. Yeah. So on that point, which I think, you know, really sums it up in the importance of vaccination and vaccination strategy for the world as well. I think, you know, that's definitely going to be the most important next, you know, the next few months and next few years as well to really get it out there, not only in our respective countries, but obviously, as we said, in India and other countries around the world that don't have as much access to, to vaccinations yet as they should. Um, so with that, I would like to thank again uh, our two wonderful speakers, Dr. Oregon, Dr. Barrett. Thank you again for spending time with us and for uh, our audience for listening in. I would like to wrap up, if we don't mind, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please.
So just again, as a reminder for everyone, NITEC, we're here to help. So if you have any uh, other questions, please just feel free to email, email us at info at NITEC.org and we'll, uh, we'll put you in contact with the appropriate people. And we'll be, we're here for any sort of technical assistance you may have. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, as well, or second to last, um, you know, there's, uh, we're available on social media. So if you have any questions, just tag us and we'll gladly respond and uh, reach out to you as well that way um, and help us come, you know, continue the conversation with this and with anything else I may have note. So overall, thank you everyone. Thank you for this amazing hour. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers and uh, looking forward to having more exciting conversations and hopefully with better understanding and better data and hopefully lower caseloads throughout the world. But thank you again, everyone for joining. Um, with that, goodbye. Thank you.